every time I take a machine apart, and especially when I like rebuild an engine, you take it all apart, you figure out what's broken, fix the broken part, put it all back together, and every time, the first time it starts up and runs, I get a little thrill out of that. It's just like an adrenaline rush. You know, I get, I really get a sense of enjoyment and pleasure from seeing that I accomplished something that, you know, everybody can't do. Seven years I've had. Seven years I started with nothing. In fact, I don't know, I told you before, I used to be a homeless drunk living on the street. And when I quit drinking, I got sober finally, clean and sober in 2003. And then I tried to start up something then, and then it's taken me, took me till 2008 to actually get a legitimate business started. And now I've had it for seven years. I'm in my seventh year. But I started with three lawnmowers and a toolbox. Yeah, it's That's why I like doing it. I like figuring out, it's like, I'm a little detective, you know, and I'm figuring out where the problem is and fixing it. So, some people think of it like a doctor, you know, where well, you're the one more doctor, they call it, or the one more detective, but it's just I'm a mechanic, and I like doing mechanic work. So, uh, I'm probably the only transgender mechanic around, but I enjoy what I do. It's kind of hard to wear makeup, high heels, but I have tried it. I've welded, actually welded, I, I do a lot of welding, and I've done welding with short shorts on, which is a big mistake, because you get burned, you get flash burns from it, just like a sunburn, really bad. So. That's my little psychology lesson here to go along with lawnmower repair. I got sober by accepting that I am who I am. And whenever I got the money, I've been wearing girl bras all my life and padding them with everything, all kinds of stuff, man. And uh, when I got the money, I had the boob job done. And I'm very proud of them. I identify most of the time as a real tough chick. You know? My friends accept me for who I am. I'm a heck of a good mechanic. I've worked on, in my lifetime, I've had, I told you this, I had lost count at 200 cars. I grew up as a kid, it was in the 60s. He's in 70s, early 70s. Uh, yeah, you're darn tootin' I hit it. And then I had some girlfriends that just barely put up with it. I bought it three years ago. I kept saying, I'm gonna start building a hot rod, I'm gonna start building a hot rod, and then uh, I was watching TV shows, there's a lot of TV shows about hot rod cars now. So I was watching those and getting more enthusiastic, and then I had a go-kart that I was building that looked like this that I've been working on for four or five years. And so, in February last year, the buddy of mine across the street over here had a heart attack. And I helped close up his shop while they took him to the hospital. And it scared me. I said, geez, the guy's only two years older than me and he had a heart attack, he might die. And I thought, if I'm gonna build a hot rod, I better damn sure get started on it. I don't know, I guess that's Riding the mini bikes and riding the go-karts is probably one of my favorite memories. I had built a mini bike out of a bicycle, and my dad was a construction worker too. He was like a 
cheap metal worker, you need a cheap metal worker. So he had, and he, we had a farm shop. We had a shop where we worked. He worked on the machines for the farm. So I, I had access to all the tools, and the, he had a welding machine. So I welded stuff up for me, and I designed this little mini bike. And he welded it up for me, and the man, I made that mini bike, and actually. I sent a photograph of it into Mechanics Illustrated magazine, and they didn't put my picture in the paper in the magazine or anything. But they did send me a little tie tack. They called it the Golden Hammer Award, and with a little golden claw hammer that said Mechanics Illustrated on it. So that was a pretty cool thing. That was a, my first recognition of success. Also got some psychological help and decided that, you know what, I don't have to get drunk or high to be who I am. You know, there's no reason for me to be ashamed of the way I feel. You know, I love Halloween because of uh, the fact that I could, you know, legitimately go out dressed up and don't feel guilty or get totally laughed at, snickered at, and so forth. But, I drank and drank and drank and drank, and I was always drunk or I was always high to feel good about doing it, okay? Which was not a good thing. And then I moved out, I lived in San Francisco for a while, and because there was a big gay community out there and I didn't understand that gays and transgenders, I didn't even understand it, that it's not the same thing. People generally fear what they don't understand. A lot of guys get angry when they see me. Because honestly, they look at me and think, gosh, look, what is that? look at that body, nice body, and they get a hard on, start getting a hard on, and then they feel guilty. Oh my God, I'm getting a hard on from a man. If I want to be who I am, then I am who I am. What the hell? Accept it. Nothing wrong with it. Some people laugh, make fun, or say nasty things, you know, just let it go. It hurts, used to hurt, but I had grew a thick skin, you know, I got alligator thick skin, man. Say something nasty, doesn't just bounce it off. I come to the conclusion that people that think that simply are uninformed. They don't understand. and aggressive and I uh, do spiteful nasty things because of my gender identity they are simply fucking bigots. You know? Hatred and bigotry have been around forever. So part of my being sober, I was a drunk. I was literally got to the point where I was a homeless drunk and so confused about my own self and about my life that I just gave up. And so I just drank all the time. All I cared about was drinking. Go to bed with a beer in my hand and drink, wake up in the night and drink some of it and then that's all I did was drink, drink, drink. And smoke some pot now and then if somebody handed it to me. But uh, the police, I was living in Key West, and the police were busting me about once a week just to save me. You know, I was drinking myself to death. So, over a Christmas holiday, at the end of 2002, it was just about Christmas time, they arrested me and put me in jail for an open container down in Key West, which is you know, they would arrest me for having an open container with a tourist walking by with drinks in their hands. So, uh, 
anyway, they put me in jail. I was in there for almost 30 days and sobered up and dried out. And the chaplain of the jail came to me and she says, the sheriff's got a deal for you. And I said, what's that? She says, he'll buy you a bus ticket anywhere you want to go if you'll leave. I said, oh, okay, let me think about this. So I had been reading uh, all the time I was in jail, going to jail for drinking, I would read novels. So there was a, a novelist by the name of John D. McDonald who wrote about uh, Travis McGee, a private detective. He wrote a whole series of books about this private detective, Travis McGee, he lived on a houseboat in Bahia Mar, Fort Lauderdale. And so I was reading those all the time. He made Fort Lauderdale sound so good. The chaplain comes back to me and she says, where do you want to go? And I said, well, I was thinking about Fort Lauderdale, okay? He says, where can you fix me up with some place to go there? And she said, yeah, I think there's a place there. So she got me a bus ticket to Fort Lauderdale and supposedly I was supposed to go into the Faith Farm. And so they put me on the bus on Friday afternoon and I got to Miami at about 11 o'clock or something and I got here at Fort Lauderdale almost midnight. And I walked from the bus station downtown, I walked over down Broward Boulevard to 7th or to 9th and then I walked out 9th which turns into Powerline Road, which is where the faith farm was. And this is in the, at Friday night, at midnight. <laughs> I'm walking through the hood, man. <laughs> and I got a bag in one hand, and I had managed to have enough money that I bought a bottle of wine, a little bottle of, uh, of wine. And so I got walked out there to the faith farm. I got there about 12, 30, or quarter to one, something like that. And they had a guard at the gate. He said, what do you want? And I said, well, I'm supposed to be checking in here. And he said, well, not now. And anyway, I, I made it to Monday morning and went and checked into the place. And I stayed there for about a month. And it got to the point where I realized you had to go to church three times a week. And you had to work all day, six days a week. And I said, and they're, and they're giving you no pay. It's all about honesty. Well, you have to be honest with yourself. Alcoholism and drug addiction are byproducts. They aren't the problem. They are a problem, but they are not the problem. Most people use drugs or drink because it makes them feel different. Okay? They feel different than the way they feel when they're not drinking or drugging. Okay? And if they want to feel different, it's because they don't like how they feel when they're sober or not on drugs. As a gay person, as a transgender person, I've seen the hate and the prejudice that black people see all the time also. So my, my suggestion would be to accept yourself as you are. And if you have... Uh, if you're a guy and you like other guys, well, accept that. You know, there's really nothing wrong with it. Love is love, okay? And that's what they're saying on TV. They just passed that uh, gay marriage thing, and it's okay with me because if you're in love, you're in love. What the heck? Love is a great thing, man. So that's what God is all about. God is love. <laughs>